uh, I guess it's a good time to, uh, to begin. So, uh, okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Maor, and for all of you, just to let you know how this uh, plenary session is gonna work, we're gonna have a 30 minute talk by uh, Professor Savicho Friend and followed by a 10 minute, uh, 10 minutes uh, Q and A. Uh, you can uh, write your questions, that questions down in the chat or wait for the end of the talk and use the raise your hand feature and then uh, you can uh, you will be able to ask your question. So, uh, okay, so I'll start. Uh, actually, I'm very happy and uh, excited to present Professor Richard Friend. Uh, professor Friend is the Cavendish Professor of Physics at the University of Cambridge. He's a physicist and an engineer and one of the most prominent architects in the fields of, uh, that, that is now known to us as organic semiconductors. Uh, most specifically, I would say that his work on carbon-based polymers, uh, polymers represents the foundation of organic electronics, uh, which is now we know is, is in a wide uh, range used in commercial technologies. His, uh, his awards and accomplishments is obviously way too long to mention here in detail, but I'll just name a few. Uh, he has more than 1,200 uh, publications that were cited over 177,000 times. Uh, as an entrepreneur, he co-founded companies based on his discoveries, commercializing the fields of organic LEDs and organic uh, field effect transistors. He was knighted by the Queen of England in 2003 for his services to physics, and is also a fellow of the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering. Uh, and at least to me, even much more impressive is the fact that he has so many uh, prominent uh, academic offsprings, just in Israel, I can, I can name uh, Gitti Frey and Neil Tesla from the Technion and uh, Rafi Schickler from uh, Ben Gurion University. And I'll just end with one unknown trivia fact about Professor Friend that I've learned uh, that he's also a very talented carpenter. So, uh, so without further ado, uh, this virtual floor is uh, yours, Professor Friend. Thank you very much for the generous introduction. And yes, it, one of the great pleasures of, of, of our world is. Um, that we, we, I mean, in particular, we're very lucky in Cambridge, we get wonderful people who come and work with us and then they remain extremely good friends uh, ever afterwards. Um, and I, it is, uh, I've, it's been a real delight to have uh, come to come to know many colleagues in Israel. I'm just sorry I can't be visiting at the moment. So the talk I'm giving, um, which I, I hope it doesn't sound too, um, obscure uh, and actually unfortunately the first few slides make it even more obscure is um, organic semiconductors why do they work and uh, the reason for that um, will become clear but bear with me um, in grander areas of physics uh, like cosmology um, there are contemplations about not just our universe but parallel universes the concept of multiverses um, and uh, I enjoyed reading about it uh, in a, in a semi-accessible um, uh, form for the general population, a very good book by Max Tegmark called Our Mathematical Universe. And he describes how if you worry about quantum mechanics um, and take it fairly literally, it's hard to avoid the prospect that there are parallel universes. But then there are various schemes for making um, these parallel universes increasingly um, strange. Uh, so the a level one multiverse is uh, there are parallel universes where everything is the same as here. They do go up to level four, but level two uh, is that there are parallel universes where the laws of science are the same. It's just that the fundamental physical constants are different. And uh, those who um, worry about why life is possible on Earth um, sort of suggest that therefore um, you know, the multiverse we're in is the one where epsilon zero is the right size and so on and so on. But actually in material science we've been creating our parallel universes without calling them that for decades and organic semiconductors I think form um, a uh, one of those. So what you're looking at on the screen is something that looks rather trivial. It's a hydrogen atom where we um, and we construct the, you know, the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom by putting an electron um, in orbit around a positive charge, a proton. Um, and we solve um, the elect where we put in the electrostatic potential um, and we have the mass of the electron. Um, and out comes the um, 
uh, various um, quantum states, the n equals one most bonding orbital down at one Rydberg below the vacuum level is 13.6 electron volts um, below the vacuum level, uh, is a huge energy. Um, and what we're looking at is chemistry, um, energies that are large enough to form strong chemical bonds. Another very large energy is the spin exchange energy, which we can look at when we we need a second electron, so we have to go up to helium. But in the first excited state of helium, we have an electron in the 1s shell and an electron in the 2s shell, and they can be spin parallel or spin anti-parallel, and there's a large spin exchange energy of order a volt between them. So that's a world where um, electrons are strongly bound to unshielded um, uh, opposite charges. It doesn't matter whether they're protons or holes. Let's go to the other extreme, and that would be a familiar inorganic semiconductor, silicon, gallium arsenide, or whatever. So what we've done is to essentially go to a parallel universe where epsilon zero is 10 times larger, and where the fundamental mass of the electron is 10 times smaller. The, that's possible to do because the background dielectric screening with all the other electrons as we go um, uh, uh, when we're fairly well down the periodic table um, uh, gives us this relative dielectric constant of 10. And if we cause electrons, uh, put the electrons into a periodic potential, so that's the polka dot pattern that I've got there, then uh, that rejigs what we think of as mass. And for most useful inorganic semiconductors, it's quite small, maybe a tenth. And the effect of that is that was what was once 13.6 electron volts falls by a factor of a thousand so that the binding between electron hole is quite small 10 milli electron volts that's less than kt so if you absorb a photon in silicon at room temperature we end up with a free electron and a free hole because the coulomb binding energy is too small at room temperature we take that for granted but it's a remarkable proposition that we can you know, effectively, we run physics or semiconductor science by just changing those those constants. Then we come to the so um, so that that's uh, two categories: the molecular semiconductors, the organics, sit very uncomfortably between the two. And um, uh, so uh, the dielectric constant is larger than one, but maybe three. Um, the effective mass for the uh, electrons or holes is it's, uh, of comparable to the free electron mass. Put those numbers back into the more the Bohr model for the hydrogen atom, um, or the uh, the Mott Vanier description of the exciton, and what we will find is that the binding energy of an electron and hole, if you like, the hydrogenic state, is quite large, about 0.5 electron volts. And similarly, the spin exchange energy, if we have a spin triplet excited state, is large, about half, half an electron volt. So those are large energies. They're not as large as chemical bonds, but they're large. And it just those numbers alone tell us that if we're going to try to move electrons around in a molecular semiconductor, we are going to have to understand what those Coulomb interactions are doing. So um, what about materials? Well, a material that was Precious to us, um, I should put a bit of pointer option and go to the laser pointer, right. Uh, so th this polymer chain here, which is a benzene ring coupled through a vinylene unit to another benzene ring, uh, is a sort of fluorescent yellow-green material um, in solution. Um, and it's, uh, quite, it's quite a fluorescent semiconductor. How do we describe it? Well, I can take this particular motif and put it on top of a um, honeycomb network, uh, which you can see here. And that we would say, and the honeycomb network, of course, describes the um, bonding arrangement for a sheet of carbon atoms in graphene. Um, and what I can uh, assert, and it's true, is that the bonding uh, in our polymer chain is the same as in graphene. We have a sort of perfect nanographene ribbon. Uh, but whereas graphene is uh, zero gap in black, we've now got a significant gap between uh, filled pi and empty pi star states. Those are the um, molecular orbitals from the leftover, what would have been fourth bond on the carbons, 
that so those PZ orbitals um, um, uh, form quite delocalized pi electron orbitals. But for graphene, we just pick up a textbook on inorganics and it works. For our uh, molecular systems, we are confronted with the fact that we have strongly localized excited states. So the luminescence, which is very efficient, is very much the same if I take a small fragment like this thing at the bottom, the sty dystyryl benzene, uh, it has all the same sort of signatures. So depending on what your education was, you would say this looks like a small molecule um, or it looks like graphene. And the answer is it's a bit of both. But what we can certainly do is move electrons around quite easily. The, uh, if you get a dense film of these materials, the overlap of the pi electron wave functions from one molecule or one chain to another is good enough to, to move charge around. So I'm going to give you a sort of uh, one device doing everything um, uh, little um, <clears throat> run through. Uh, and what we have here um, is um, a transistor. Uh, so the transistor, we have a substrate, which is glass. We put down some electrodes. Um, in this case, they're 20 microns apart. So it's quite a large separation uh, and they're um, evaporated gold. Uh, there is a um, layer of organic semiconductor. For those who like the chemistry, it's this thing here. It's a fluorescent yellow-green emitter. Then we put a layer of insulator, which is polymethyl methacrylate, um, on top. And then we finish that with a semi-transparent thin gold layer, which acts as the gate. So that looks like a transistor. We have source and drain and gate. We have semiconductor and we have an insulator. So what happens with transistors, if you, is if you put a voltage, say put a negative voltage on the gate and keep the source and drain together, if it works, we will induce positive charges um, in the semiconductor to match negative charges in the gate electrode um, and electric field in the insulator layer. And those positive charges uh, are mobile and we can that will function as a transistor. I could reverse the sign of the gate voltage, in which case, if things worked well, I would induce negative charges. That's standard P and N type behavior. Usually it's difficult to get the same operation in the same device because of the challenge of um, barriers for charge injection and extraction. But um, rather magically for this particular system, um, the electron and hole injection are comparable and neither of them brilliant, but both of them good enough. So we have the possibility of running the device in ambipolar mode, where we uh, now put a decent voltage between source and drain, uh, say put the gate voltage halfway between, and the sort of pattern of induced charge would be, as you can see um, uh, in the cartoon at the moment, electrons on the left, holes on the right. But of course there's a field pulling um, electrons to the right and holes to the left. And where they meet one another in the channel, we would expect electron hole capture to produce um, light emission. So that the video that I'm going to finally get around to showing you, what you can see is that we have strips of source and drain. It's an interdigitated arrangement with a 20 micron um, uh, feature size, both for the width of those strips and the spacing between them. What, what we're now doing is putting a, re, uh, changing the gate voltage to run from the source to the drain voltage. And as that happens, the point where electrons and holes meet one another in the channel uh, is swept across the channel. And you can see, you can see that Maxwell's equations work. We get fringe fields around the edge. Um, and there we have a lovely device that is a transistor that lights up um, and, it, and eventually it stops lighting up because the uh, point of the line of recombination has disappeared under the, um, the far electrode. Uh, so that was um, work done um, 15 years ago by um, my uh, colleagues, um, uh, Henning Seringhaus um, um, uh, is now uh, Professor um, alongside me in the Cavendish. But that's a, an example of a device that isn't very useful, but it does show you quite graphically um, what we can do. Um, 
the light emission, of course, is widely exploited in smartphones. I'm sorry, this isn't a current generation smartphone. Um, and um, increasingly affordable um, OLED TVs um, made principally by Korean companies. Um, in order for that to have happened, thing, uh, the engineering of those devices has been advanced a very long way. They're very, very efficient light sources. And that, some time back, was a big surprise. Um, and the reason for that is that the Coulomb interaction and the large spin exchange energy um, uh, should cause problems. So I'm going to illustrate what uh, the Coulomb interaction, uh, what the spin exchange energy does um, to excited states. These are some calculations um, due to um, uh, colleagues in Cambridge, Antonis Albertus um, and Tommy Montserrat. Um, it is now published, I should have brought that slide up to date. Uh, for pentacene, it's five fused benzene rings. It's got a semiconductor gap at about 1.8 electron volts. Uh, in the solid film, in a crystal um, structure, uh, the spin singlet exciton is sort of centered on one pentacene, but actually spreads out quite well over neighboring pentacenes. Um, the singlet um, likes to delocalize because that actually reduces the um, uh, the electron electron re uh, repulsion energy term. On the other hand, if we switch from uh, that singlet to the spin triplet, um, where um, we've now where the excited state with uh, notionally an electron in a pi and an, also a second one in a pi star state, uh, put them in this triplet state. Uh, the um, exchange energy works the other way around, and the exciton localizes just to one pentacene, and it becomes much lower energy. It actually drops to about 0.9 volts. It's almost half the energy of the singlet. So that is a very unfamiliar story uh, if you're brought up on Gallimard's node. So that has a big bearing on how uh, OLEDs work. Uh, so an organic LED, um, if we think in, in molecular terms, we have a spin singlet ground state, we have a spin singlet excited state that, which we can produce by photon absorption. But if we produce it by electron hole capture, as I showed you in the transistor, the spin statistics um, of two spin a half objects, electron and hole re, um, capturing one another, would put one in four in the spin zero singlet state, which is what we want for light emission, three out of four, as spin triplets. Um, and if it's a simple hydrocarbon, they will emit very slowly because of course phosphorescence is forbidden. So what is done um, principally in today's OLEDs is to um, bring uh, in um, enough spin orbit coupling to arrange for fairly fast phosphorescence from the triplet. Uh, the, uh, the best way to do it is to bring in organometallic complexes. This one, um, those with iridium work particularly well. This was uh, uh, Thompson and Forrest um, then at Princeton. And for all um, today's OLED things in the market, uh, the red and the green subpixels use phosphorescent emitters. But they haven't, it's not possible yet to find materials which will do blue phosphorescence sufficiently, or sufficiently blue. Uh, and what is done at the moment um, is to do something called triplet triplet to singlet conversion. And the scheme, um, and this is a paper we published um, a few years ago, Dao Edi and Le Yang, um, where uh, if I can take you through the little cartoon on the top left, we an electron and a hole capture one another to form this bound exciton which one in four will, uh, events will be a spin singlet, and that will give prompt electroluminescence. Three and four, it forms a triplet, and the triplet population builds up, and it builds up to be sufficiently high that the dominant decay channel for those triplets is that two triplets in an overall singlet configuration fuse to form a singlet. So two triplets, um, uh, become a singlet, and then we get the singlet emission. And we know about that in various ways, but one is that the electroluminescence comes out time delayed. Uh, as you can see in the plot on the right, um, where we have a device where 
we're driving it with a constant current and then we switch the pulse off. Uh, there's an instantaneous drop of light emission corresponding to the loss of the um, prompt singlet emission, but then there's a long, slow, continued emission as the triplets diffuse, capture one another or fuse and produce singlets. And what uh, we showed in that paper is that that um, fusion reaction was up to 70% efficient. Um, and it is absolutely engineered into the blue subpixels in today's um, organic LEDs. It's quite a strange um, reaction, um, uh, but it, there have been um, ways not usually in the public domain uh, to make that pretty efficient. So the one of the things I will just briefly mention things that we've been doing recently in Cambridge is trying to find material systems where the spin um, um, plays differently. And we've actually been looking at materials which in the ground state have a net spin, if you like them, molecular magnets. Uh, so for those who don't like chemistry, I will go fairly quickly. Um, but here is our um, a, a, a molecule that's been uh, important for us. I should say it was Feng Li from Jilin University in China who came as a visitor to our group. Uh, who worked with uh, Emrys Evans, um, who now has a faculty position in, in Wales in Swansea, um, who did some put together this uh, this story. Um, so on the top in black, we have a radical. Uh, we have a single carbon uh, with three bonds to these are uh, benzenes, phenylenes, um, in three directions, and left over is a spin. Uh, just the electron count will tell you that there must be. It's like graphene with a stranded electron or PZ, PZ orbital um, that can't talk to anything else. Um, so there's the spin. Uh, and what lights these materials up um, is, uh, for reasons I'm not going to run through this morning, uh, is when we then connect that, chemically bond it onto something else, um, and this is a carbosyl group, um, which actually acts as an electron donor. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you just check through, we've got lots and lots of or alternation of single and, and, and double carbon bonds tells us we have an extended power electron system. And in the ground state, um, which I haven't shown, uh, we have uh, the molecular orbitals on this carbazole fully occupied, but we have a singly occupied molecular orbital, a so-called SOMO, uh, on the radical group. Um, and very surprisingly, uh, the optical transition that lifts an electron up from the highest occupied molecular orbital on the carbazole to leave a hole behind there, but, but put an electron onto the singly occupied molecular orbital on this um, carbon here, uh, that transition up and down is surprisingly allowed and efficient. Um, and it's between those states that we get um, uh, efficient, uh, both photoluminescence and also electroluminescence. We've had some really quite efficient light emitting diodes. And the reason we're pressing this, um, or, or at, at its most trivial level, um, um, is, I mean, trivial, but, but maybe important, is that there is no lower lying excited state than this one here. There's no equivalent of a lower lying triplet. It would actually have to be a quartet because of the symmetries we've got, or the broken symmetries we've got here, that's the lowest excited state. So there's no leakage channel that we had to patch up with the uh, triplets through the triplet-triplet fusion. Uh, so we start with um, a system where we um, should, should be able to avoid that problem. Uh, there's another problem which is quite surprising. Um, um, it, it, well, that we, we had to worry about, um, and um, it was, it's best to do the experiments first and then worry about why they work later. Is that if I show you the, um, uh, the there's a scheme for how we think the LED works. We start in the ground state. So here we have the occupied, um, the the the, the, the uh, highest occupied molecular orbital on the carbazole doubly occupied. We have the singly occupied uh, radical level like that. If I now bring an electron in, um, we hope it ends up, in fact, it has no choice but to end up on that level um, on the radical side of the molecule. So we've now got doubly occupied but negatively charged uh, and we've got filled states. 
So if I ask what happens if I now bring a hole in, you would, well, one naively would presume um, that we would simply remove that electron again, because that's the highest, uh, um, it, it's the most available electron to remove. So in that sense, a radical system is a bit like a metal. We have the same energy for electron injection and electron extraction. Um, but it turns out that we are able to inject the hole very reliably um, onto this deeper line orbital um, on the carbazole, partly because we uh, in include this emissive molecule um, as a fairly, in a fairly low concentration in a host of uh, this molecule here, um, so, um, carbazole biphenyl, um, and there'll be resonant tunneling of holes on this host onto the carbazole group um, on the uh, radical molecule. But there are some interesting issues, which I won't run through now, uh, about charging effects, that the energy at which you can put a second electron onto the single alkylic orbital is higher than the energy at which you can remove it. Um, the, uh, there's a sort of Hubbard U uh, that plays a strong role, something one doesn't usually have to think about in semiconductors. So um, uh, in, in, I'm regarding this as a general talk, so this is the point for the humorous slide, um, which someone gave me a few years ago. Um, uh, those of us who work on displays um, in this sort of modern world, um, where we, more questions have asked of whether we should be uh, being useful or not, uh, we, 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 can, uh, we can worry a little. Um, uh, but then, of course, what we do is turn around and say, well, light emission um, is just the other side of a coin to a photovoltaic. Um, and photovoltaics, um, of course, are now really important. Silicon does a great job, um, but it um, uh, is still a pretty poor user of materials than uh, a really efficient um, photosynthesizer. So this is uh, this is corn, which uh, I, I think is considered to be the one of the, the fastest, most efficient converters of sunlight into chemical energy. Um, and uh, a, a leaf doesn't, uh, it, you don't require a silicon foundry um, to make a leaf um, and leaves manage to pr produce more energy than was required to make them within not many days, otherwise plants wouldn't grow. So we have some way to go. And there's been a lot of interest with um, organics for um, solar cells, where um, the problem that when you absorb a photon, you produce a bound electron hole um, pair or exciton um, would suggest that you wouldn't get many free carriers if you just absorb light and organic semiconductor and that's true. So what is done is to form a blend of um, two materials, a donor and acceptor with offset levels so that the uh, there's an incentive for the electron to transfer um, from a higher energy state on the donor to a lower energy level um, on the acceptor. And the key is to get enough surface area between donor and acceptor that all photo excitations find their way to the interface to do charge separation. And then that network has to allow um, connectivity back to the collection electrodes. But there are many, many material systems that, that, that work quite well. And for the organics, the ones that work well, we literally mix the two components up in a common solvent and just um, paint down a film. And the system that uh, filled the literature for many years from 1995 onwards um, is uh, a, a polymer donor. Uh, it's, uh, this is a polythiophene, poly 3 hexylthiophene which absorbed across the visible spectrum. And then for many years, the mainstay has been um, a, a fullerene, a C60 or a C70, derivatized to make it appropriately soluble. Uh, that, so that's the acceptor. So a, a photon absorbed. Um, uh, produces um, an excited state um, that um, produces a, with a high enough electron energy uh, 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 electron um, that it will drop to a lower energy state on the right and uh, on the fullerene and that does the charge separation. Um, now, rem remarkably, um, actually, I'm looking. I'm, I'm, go I'm, I'm going a little bit slowly. I, um, I think I'm going to quickly go through a few slides and perhaps take another five minutes. I'm looking at no, no one is pointing a finger at me yet, but uh, I will do that. Yeah, yeah Professor, Professor Frenzo, Yeah, in maybe in five minutes it'll be good. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so um, 
what I'm going to just briefly say is that uh, the rather, I mean, it's more a sort of commentary on what's been happening in the field, is that the efficiencies had been stuck um, at quite low levels um, with the fullerene systems. In the last two or three years, the efficiencies have really jumped up. So now up at 18%, which, which is a high number. It's not high enough. And that's come through a lot of chemistry. Um, and principally, it's involved junking um, the fullerene as the acceptor. And there are a whole set of what are called non-fullerene acceptors, NFAs. Um, uh, and there's a magic material called Y6, um, which is this thing here, which with a number of donors produces really efficient solar cells now up to um, 18, the 18% 18 figure. One of the things we had been looking at, um, and I'm going to go very quickly to this slide here, this is Alex Gillett um, in, in my group, um, is looking for the formation of spin triplets. Um, because a good solar cell, we have to have an equilibrium between um, of free carriers and recombination in the bulk to reform photons. That's part of the thermodynamics in the you know, goodish shock equizer um, solar cell. And that recombination should form triplets in the same way as happens in LEDs. It's on the whole rather ignored in the field. And we've gone looking, and even in these really good um, organic solar cells, the PM6Y6, we find that bimolecular recombination forms those same irritating triplets that limits OLED operation. Um, and so the good news is that we know that there's a lost channel, which if we could engineer out, we could do even better. And we have found some systems, I've just given you the acronym of the molecules, um, where we don't find triplets and we have an explanation. There's a hybridization between donor and acceptor that um, flips over the energetics of the singlet and triplet um, states um, for electrons and holes confined at the interface between the two. We have two systems that break the mold. So in the remaining couple of minutes, I'm going to mention that um, uh, there's another little twist, uh, um, uh, and that is that um, uh, if the story for OLEDs is that we have irritating triplets that have lost energy compared to the singlet, um, but we use collisions between triplets um, to fuse them to make singlets. And again, that's alive and well in the blue subpixels and OLED displays. If we rearrange the energy levels and the organics give us huge opportunities to do that, we can bring the triplet down to half the singlet energy. And that is what happens in the pentacene example that I mentioned earlier on. In that case, that fusion reaction runs in the opposite direction. It becomes a fission reaction. We photo excite a spin singlet, and it then um, evolves to form, form a spin, uh, two spin triplet excitons. Um, and back 10 years ago, we, we did a lot of work, and obviously the many other groups are pretty interested in this, uh, to show that happening. Um, uh, so this is time-resolved optical spectroscopy um, running from 100 femtoseconds to a microsecond. Uh, and the green trace are the spin singlets, which within about 80 femtoseconds, it's a really short time, have split to become pairs of triplet excitons, which then live for tens of nanoseconds. But then in this particular structure, we got a donor acceptor heterojunction with pentacene donor C60 acceptor, um, and at that point we get charge generation. That happens out at towards a microsecond. So we we can track that evolution of this fission to pairs of triplets to uh, eventually charges. Now in the right embodiment, that might be quite useful for solar cells. Um, solar cells, uh, a silicon solar cell uses the spectrum quite poorly. We have. Um, by definition, a single, so a single junction solar cell can't do more than about 33% efficiency. That's shock equizer. Uh, we don't absorb any longer infrared wavelengths in the visible or near infrared in the visible. Uh, we absorb, but we only get the voltage equivalent to the lowest band gap of 1.1 volts in silicon. So it's about 0.7 volts we can get from a silicon cell. But there's a lot of wasted energy from the more energetic photons. So if we could magically put a layer on top of a silicon solar cell that absorbed this, the, these higher energy photons, split them to pair of, pairs of triplets, and then 
converted the triplets to use for energy in the solar cell, we could give a big uplift to the um, um, yellow, green, blue um, part of the spectrum. Um, and the way that um, um, my colleague actually Rao, actually Rao has been pushing this uh, is, to, is to have a slightly complex film where we absorb singlets. Um, we have a singlet fission material, material that produces triplets and we then cause those to run into nanocrystals of at the moment lead sulfide, which can then emit inf near infrared photons, which we hope can be absorbed in, a, in the silicon solar cell. Not everything works, but the fission bit does. Um, and we've been doing quite a lot of work uh, on finding the right sort of matrix where we have these um, quantum dots of lead sulfide to do the emission, because they, they, they're fairly agnostic as to whether they absorb singlets or triplets. And then we have the fission material as a host uh, to do that. Um, so uh, some things work, but not everything, but that, that's the vision. So let me finish with uh, one of the earlier slides, uh, and I hope I've given you a, uh, well, put forward the proposition that my sort of green column is a, a different universe for uh, how we think about and how we engineer semiconductor phenomena, um, and uh, in many cases that's been pretty successful, uh, and I happen to think there are many, many more things that haven't yet been tried out. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor, for the really inspiring talk. Uh, okay, so the floor is open for questions. Um, you can you raise your hand? Or, okay. Yeah, Daniel, you can, you can unmute yourself on that, I guess. Oh, Daniel, you're just clapping. It was just uploading. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I, I, actually, I'd, I would want to ask a question. Uh, so, so you mentioned the the fact that this this compound, the organic compound with the, the radical, is, has a a rather efficient uh, emission. Uh, like, would you say that it's like a, like a general concept that that organic molecules that has some, this type of radical can be uh, can be efficient? No, it, it, no, it, it, um, thank you. That, that was a really helpful question. We, we, we do have a um, more recent paper, it was in Nature Materials 2020, where um, we've explored some of the reasons why some are very good to couple with light and others are not. If you just take a simple radical where you have sort of symmetry between the, um, the, the, the uh, homo and the lumo, and the sumo is halfway, it's the non-bonding, and we have bonding below and anti-bonding above, then the optical transition um, involving the sumo can be either from homo to sumo or sumo to lumo, and they mix, and the lower energy transition is forbidden. And the magic is that when we bring in a symmetry-breaking connection onto the carbazole, that's when the transition becomes allowed, Mm -hmm. And that's when they light up. And if you look at the literature on radical semiconductors, and there's lots of literature on them, there's virtually nothing about the luminescence because for the most part, they don't luminesce. But we have a design rule, which we think is general. Uh, okay, uh, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Hi, my name is Rene. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I just want uh, a quick reminder on the uh, why. Uh, why are what are the reasons to develop non-fullerene acceptors? You mentioned it, but it was not so clear to me. Uh, I went very quickly through it. Um, uh, the, there are a lot of very good groups. Um, there's a lot of good synthetic chemistry. Um, I think it was curiosity to see if we could find, if the field could find alternatives to the fullerenes. Um, and uh, uh, there have been many attempts over a couple of decades and then magically all, you know, all of a sudden, um, there are a couple of, you know, well, more than two families that work well. It, 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 it's one of these, yeah, I, I wouldn't say there was a, it was guided by, or this was guided by a clear sense of what the right answer was. There's a lot of empiricism, but, but it's, okay. um, it, it sort of lifted the field. Yeah, thank you. 
Okay, so uh, I want again to thank Professor Richard Friend for uh, uh, sparing his time for giving us this, uh, this talk, interesting talk. Uh, and we're going for a break for 10 minutes and we'll be back for the next uh, parallel session. So thank you everyone. And obviously, again, thank you, Professor. Can, can I thank you all for, for listening? And uh, it looks a great program. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to to being able to visit in the not too distant future. So, yeah, thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank Hopefully. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.